Great. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I hope this lavalier mic is on. Um, so it may sound like I know what I'm talking about, uh, but I, I actually, I'm at a moment in my life when for the first time I'm actually directing a library like many of you, if an actual physical library, there it is. It's a Snell Library on Northeastern's campus. And as part of becoming a librarian um, and thinking about what it means to run a university library, I, I'm thinking about what I think all of you are thinking about, which is um, where are we in the, the long history of libraries? I'm actually very jealous of, of Jessica running a library that's been there for a long time rather than 1990, as this <laughs> library is. Uh, but um, as a historian, I think we're, we're really at a very interesting point in the history of libraries because of many of the things that have, have impacted us um, since the advent of the web a quarter century ago. Um, and even before that, some of the trends that were going on in the way libraries were working and working together. And, and I emphatically put that word into the title because I, I want to talk a lot today about what it means to work together. And in fact, Digital Public Library of America was really, as, as I'd like to say, it was an exercise in togetherness of how libraries work together, which is actually not that easy. Um, so, I think as we look at the 100-year history of libraries, the 1,000-year history of libraries, so many of the themes of this conference over the past few days have, have touched on really the big changes of our age that we're in the midst of tackling and that are really a multi-decade effort to address. The first one is that, that my library, like your library, is not alone. It's, it's part of a network. Our libraries exist in a network. And um, as I think about this, I'm also thinking about it from the user's perspective, from the student's perspective, from the pr professor's perspective. I still have on campus every year, our library receives about 2 million visitors, we get 10 to 12,000 gate checks a day. It's a lot of people coming in and out of the physical library. But of course, we have an order of magnitude more than that, visiting library.northeastern.edu every day. We have multiple campuses. Um, and also, um, the way people see the library, it's also as a virtual library. They are experiencing it online. They're thinking about resources that they can get through interlibrary loan. And so what I'm struggling with right now is really thinking about how we express that to our patrons, how we express it to the researchers. What are we telling them about our library? And at the end of my talk, I want to come to this idea of the library as a kind of user interface. How do we present ourselves? And, and how do people, in a sense, read the library? How is the library legible to them as an institution? Incorporating truly and very deeply this idea of a library sitting in a networked environment, I think, is one of our really key challenges. And, and this really came about a lot of my thinking about this in working at the Digital Public Library of America, which now has over 20 million items um, brought together from about 2,500 different libraries, archives, museums, historical sites. Um, and so this was a virtual um, synthesis of these many collections. It surfaced in a lot of ways um, new collections, um, collections that were distributed, and I want to talk at length about that. Um, you know, and, and everywhere I would go to talk about DPLA, oddly, um, the, the day Donald Trump was elected, I was in Riga, um, Latvia, and I was, I was giving a talk there, which was very strange um, to be there uh, a couple of Novembers ago. But I just did a search on, on Riga, and we had 800 um, items in the Digital Public Library of America from this city. And of course, when you, when you dig down, um, what you find is that this collection is scattered across the United States. So there were images at the New York Public Library, 100-year-old uh, photos. Um, there were um, these weird um, fire department insignias that sit in a uh, science museum in Missouri. We had books that were scanned at, from the University of Michigan published in Riga or about Riga. Um, there were um, very old photographs and daguerreotypes at the University of, C of uh, Washington um, in Seattle. And there were architectural plans in Columbia. So um, 
Maybe an obvious point, but I always like to sort of go under the hood and look at the contributing institution page at DPLA. And what you would see is that for any topic, the actual collection about a subject was scattered extremely widely. And um, it's only really, of course, through the network that we're able to kind of re-aggregate this collection. Um, near the end of my tenure at DPLA, there were a number of institutions that um, had the distributed collections of um, the poet Emily Dickinson, um, Harvard and Amherst among them, that for the first time reunited all of her original drafts and letters and all of her writing into one location and then were able to deposit it in DPLA. And of course that was the, the power of this idea of reuniting collections. So networked resources, people, and institutions are of course a key challenge. And, I was at the workshop um, yesterday afternoon. Um, Lorcan Dempsey uh, um, gave a great sort of introduction for me of sort of how some of this networking has happened in the UK, um, which is in some ways similar, in some ways different. It's maybe a little bit more centralized in some cases. Um, but these challenges around the, the networked library, I think, are still, we're still struggling with them. I mean, if we can be frank about it, because it is actually hard to get outside of your specific institution and think about how to interact with other institutions, what strengths you have, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. So synthetic collections, right? Almost everything from the perspective of the user is now not just local, but in fact synthetic from other places that to, now putting on my historian cap, to me as a researcher, I care a lot less that it's in my local institution as long as I can access it through my local institution. And in fact, if you talk to researchers or teachers who are incredibly busy, they're running to class, they're in the lab, they're doing these works, they don't necessarily make the distinctions that we make in our mind about what the library is. The legibility of the library to them has changed. And they may not even be aware of it. So how do we express that to them, and how do we leverage the fact that we now have these great synthetic collections? I think the second big challenge, and it's of course related, is just this question of scale. Um, it is um, really astonishing as a historian to think about the scale of resources we have access to. Um, and I've been privileged to be at at places with very large libraries. I did my, my PhD work at Yale. I literally could not have done my dissertation there without the fact that they had so many books that I was able to look up very rare books in the history of math that were actually physically on campus and then I was able to come here and do some work here. Um, but it was, it was physical access to those books. Now I can, you know, at 3 a.m. in my pajamas, access all the same books online and many more that I didn't realize existed. Um, and not only that, but just again, keeping my historian's hat on for a minute, um, I have access to new collections that are almost unimaginably large and that confuse me. So um, it, when Roy Rosenzweig and I wrote a book on digital history, which is now almost 15 years old, um, even then, 15 years ago, we were looking at the case of the poor presidential historian who's working on uh, presidential history, but is no longer working on, let's say, Lyndon Johnson, like Robert Caro did in his, in his masterful work um, on LBJ, who read literally over a decade or more tens of thousands of memos from the White House. Now you have in a modern White House literally a billion emails in a four-year period. In the first uh, White House that had access to email, the Bill Clinton White House, eight years, they had about 40 million emails. So you can no longer read it all, right? And that's what I was taught to do as a researcher is you find your topic, you locate the material about it, you read everything, and then you sit down and write a book, right? That's, that, that was the method. So that's no longer possible. And libraries have always been good and now need to kind of reassert ourselves as an institution that help researchers sort through unimaginably large collections, through metadata and through new means, I think, of finding what we want to look for. So that scale, the fact that we went from the 1960s, the 1990s, 
just in one institution, the White House, of several orders of magnitude, five orders of magnitude, larger of a collection to deal with is, is tough. Um, Library of Congress access, uh, accessioned the Twitter archive. Billions and billions of tweets. Everyone, I think, snickered at it when, at the Library of Congress when um, they set, up, set this up. Um, and, and yet, it is an important collection that people will have to sort through. Historians will sort through that. Um, it happens that we now have a president who used this medium um, almost exclusively for pronouncements. So that will become an important resource. But um, you can't read every tweet, right? even in several lifetimes. So what do we do about this question of scale as well? Um, seems really, really critical to me. And um, you know, it worked for many years with my friends at Europeana. There's over 50 million items there. I mentioned DPLA, 20 million items. These are just in these really special, unique collections. Um, of course, we're now dealing with large shared print collections. So um, it's a great article recently in the Columbia student newspaper about recap, combined collections um, in, that sit in a warehouse in New Jersey um, from several major institutions, Princeton and Columbia and, and NYPL, among them 20 million volumes that now sit in New Jersey. Um, obviously, as you can see here, are not exactly accessible to researchers directly. And so the process of discovery within that has changed for the researcher. And I want to come back to the movement of books as well and physical items. But the legibility of the library now with something like Recap is different for me as a researcher. If I go to the library and I know most of my books that I need are somewhere else. They're sort of out there. I, I didn't even know where this was. In fact, it's evidently unmarked on Google Maps, so I can't even go there. Um, so what does, that, what does that mean, the fact that we have this kind of um, outside world to our library? Um, I didn't even mention, of course, scientific collections, which um, as a historian of science, you know, the old, old saying about this is that 90% of the scientists who ever lived are alive today. And that's um, a shocking and also maybe true stat. Maybe it's 85% at this point, but um, certainly 20 years ago that was true. And, and that also means that our science production is just enormous. Um, the scale not only of articles, but increasingly we're all dealing with data sets that are, again, extremely large. Um, uh, climate science, for instance, produces petabyte scale climate models. What do we do with those? Um, so scale is a huge problem. So coming back to, to my humble library, what, what am I to sort of think about the approach of our library? Um, so we have a decent sized collection, but we are, we're not a Cambridge, we're not a Yale. Um, we have a lot of research going on on our campus. Um, it has actually surged at Northeastern campus. We're a research one university. We have people working across the science and technology fields. We also have arts and science, arts and humanities, social sciences. Um, so what does this building, what does the institution of the library um, mean? So I, I come to this word togetherness, um, which, which I use very intentionally because, and I, I felt this really at DPLA as well and then in other projects that I've worked on, like when we started working over a decade ago on Zotero, the, the citation, open source citation tool that we created at George Mason, um, I was thinking about collaboration and how we kind of work together. And collaboration is really, really hard. Um, you know, human beings are social animals, but actually we don't collaborate well naturally. Um, we like to kind of be together, but we also like to be separate. And actually that's part of, the, I think, the concept behind togetherness is how we can kind of be adjacent and having interactions without unifying. Um, and, and here again, I've heard really interesting examples um, from uh, the UK about how you're doing it. And there are different models for it. But my point about togetherness, and it's really exemplified in something like DPLA, is there's ways to be virtually unified and yet remain separate. Um, there are political and social ways to do just that, to have a kind of light affiliation where we're still doing our own things and maybe doing some things better than other folks, but yet leveraging what's out there in the network 
and addressing together the question of scale, because I think individually we can't address scale. We have to address it together because it's so big, and we can leverage our combinations to do that. So just a, a, a small example from DPLA that I, I really liked. When um, there was a, a thaw in our relationship with Cuba, maybe now it's refreezing, um, but um, the National Library in um, Cuba um, added a little button for DPLA. We had an application programming interface. We had open data. Um, they were able to add um, links to WorldCat, of course, OCLC, and DPLA so that when they digitized their card catalog, they could actually um, have a button and link to um, a digitized book from Harvard. Um, very lightweight way of leveraging the association um, and the relationship together. Um, so um, these lightweight connections, and often they do happen technically, but I also want to talk about some social methods, are really key. How can we increase this kind of interconnectivity? So the, the kinds of words that I throw around with, with my staff now are, are these things. It's sort of how do we think about collaborative spirit, shared spirit? How do we leverage our diversity, which I think is really quite critical. There's some things I know, but there's lots and lots of things I don't know. And having a diverse staff with different viewpoints and coming from different backgrounds is really critical. And then also I think um, part of this discussion is about interdisciplinarity. So I'm a historian, but I've worked a lot in technology. I think everybody is going to have to be working a little bit outside of their um, very distinct disciplines to tackle this. And the modes of approaches, so sort of how we do it, are through these kind of flexible, multifunctional, capacious, service-based. These are the kinds of words that I really emphasize we need to work on. Um, and I'm not sure, actually, that libraries have been so good in these areas. Having very flexible services is actually really hard. It's hard on staff who might have to be doing many different things. Um, tools, it's often hard to build a tool that's multifunctional. If you, if you code something, you're often sort of rigorously coding it for specific use cases. And um, you know, a great example of that from actually just going back to Zotero, you know, we did it for people like us, researchers who needed a great way to pull citations right off the web, right within the web browser. Then it ended up being used by, um, by people to store recipes because they realized that they could extract ingredients off the web. We never thought about that, but they ended up using that tool. Lawyers ended up using the tool for case law, and we never hard-coded in any of that. It just happened to be that the tool was very multifunctional from its spec, and others went and, and used it. Um, capaciousness, the ability to store lots of data and operate on that data is really key. And of course, we're again in a multi-decade um, movement from, um, from nouns to verbs, from things that we have physically in our library to services that we provide that access those things, including those that we ourselves have, but then also operate on, find um, other material outside of our specific world. So thinking more about services and the verbs that we incur. So I was very interested to look at the strategic plan that RLUK has, and, and already has a lot of these elements in it. So one of the, the kind of a good case study for this sort of model, of dealing with scale and dealing with the network, is the way that libraries are now acting as kind of stewards, not just for their material, but for this material that's out there on the network, curating distributed materials. Um, of course, Europea, Europeana did this from the start, DPLA as well in their um, uh, site on the Great War. Um, they have materials not just from Europeana, but drawn from New Zealand, from DPLA, and from Australia, from Trove. Um, these kinds of projects, I think, are really great. The fashion site that Europeana runs that, again, curates for the network um, 400,000 items, uh, apparel. Um, there are biological samples, um, uh, these kinds of things that are being curated by specific entities that are set up again, in a lightweight way, in the same way that DPLA was a fairly lightweight, and Europeana is a fairly lightweight institution, given the scale that we're dealing with, to handle the coordination 
but having a lot of the work actually happen in a kind of decentralized fashion, the actual scanning. We now have um, uh, groups, uh, University of Minnesota has set up a kind of subsite that leverages DPLA to curate materials around African American history. Um, so they are now dealing with, I think this is an old slide, I think they're up to about a, a million items um, through their Umbra search, where they've said, um, you know, we have a specific expertise in this area, we have specific researchers who are interested in this, and they've gone out and tackled um, how you kind of deal with the curation um, in this area. I think an even more interesting and um, more contemporary model is, doc is documenting the now, um, which is a project that has set up um, tools and practices, tools and practices, but not necessarily even a lightweight centralized organization to actually allow distributed libraries um, to go ahead and archive social media, photographs, documents from unrest in the United States in our time. Um, and then to be able to synthesize that together into collections. So um, Documenting the Now has had, I think, a lot of success in being right at the moment, right? Because they know that now in a kind of born digital age, you have to collect while the material still exists. You have to kind of go out there. Um, and they know that um, the best people to do that collecting are those right in the community who actually interact with the community, who can co-create with the community. So they're providing this kind of platform for um, saving materials, for putting it in a library, setting it on a preservation path that it would not normally have. But then turning around and saying, okay, if you do that in Ferguson, and we do that in Boston, we can interoperate our materials that are gonna have the same metadata standard. They're gonna have all this stuff. In fact, don't even worry about those things. That's all going to happen behind the scenes. I think these kinds of projects that are proactive and that are distributed but that interact are, are a great kind of contemporary example of togetherness. This is um, happening at scale. There are millions of items being saved, but it's not being done by one institution. It's not being done by DPLA, although I hope some of this material will go into DPLA. It's happening out there on the network, and it leverages thousands of people, literally, to deal with the question of scale and how we save the history of our time. At Snell Library, we're doing the same thing. So we're thinking about, and again, I saw this in the strategic plan, of what, what does your library do well? And then let's enable your library to do that. This, this whole point, I think, is really key of no longer necessarily being well-rounded. Right? The legibility of the library is, oh yeah, my library sort of has it all. I go to my library to get this. Now libraries can get that well-roundedness from the network. We're very lucky in that we don't have a huge collection um, of books, but we can get them very quickly for people. We have lots of virtual books that we can provide, and we can get physical ones for you as well. Um, but we do have some specialties, and we want to, in fact, be angular rather than well-rounded. We want to emphasize, actually, what we do really well. And what we do really well on the special collection side is that we have a lot of material about Boston. We have an urban campus, it sits right in downtown Boston, and um, we don't have extensive holdings from across the United States, but we have really good collections from the communities right around us. Um, and we have taken on curating this material and curating it for the Boston area around certain things. So we have a project with six other, six other institutions um, on the desegregation of the Boston public schools, which um, if you're not familiar with Boston history, was a, a, a very um, tense period in race relations in the city um, and where busing began and Students were bused to different neighborhoods to sort of integrate the schools. It was um, really um, a, a huge upheaval. There were huge um, um, fights and, uh, around this, and many documents um, that were saved by Northeastern and other institutions. So um, thousands of these things now are, again, synthesized together, a new synthetic collection. They exist physically at other places, but they've been digitized. And um, we have kind of brought them together by linking up in a lightweight way with these other institutions. 
Um, so um, they have all taken their materials, digitized it, um, put it into DPLA. We're actually leveraging pieces of the DPLA infrastructure, but we're also leveraging our local expertise within our archives to curate and um, describe and contextualize this material. So a relatively small collection, some thousands of documents, but it's an important moment in the history and culture of Boston. And we realized we could really take an approach to this that would help um, curate it for everyone uh, to use. We also actually have pretty extensive holdings of um, newspapers in Boston um, and other materials. Um, we, our librarians have actually gone out into local area neighborhoods to record oral histories of those neighborhoods. So we have one in Lower Roxbury. Um, our campus is sort of um, right on the border between Roxbury and uh, Boston. And the, the traditionally the African American community, the sort of center of culture has been in the Roxbury area. Um, we had um, a year ago um, librarians, again, working with the community, go out and actually record oral histories um, that we now preserve um, digital video of in our digital repository service. And we are um, putting those together with these other materials. Um, we also have access to maps from Boston Public Library. We have our own maps across time. And so in general, we realize that our angularity is really around our situation here in Boston and how we can sort of take these things and bring them together. And so our thinking really is now we are going to focus on the Boston area and think about how we can enable research about this. And some of this will involve our own collections, but some of it will involve going out and being together with other local institutions, and in fact, through DPLA, other national institutions, where we can pull together Boston materials and provide services around them. So someone who wants to find anything about Boston can sort of come to Northeastern, can study it, can pull it together. We also have in the library, one of our other strengths is we have a big digital unit. It's one of the things that really drew me to Northeastern. We have um, developers in the library, software developers. We have um, uh, um, people who work in digital scholarship. We actually have a very vibrant digital scholarship group that's based literally in the library. Um, and we have a lot of researchers at the university who are very good at dealing with large scale data sets. And they exist across the university in history and English and network science, computer science. And so we're leveraging all of them to also integrate into this idea of a research center around Boston, um, data from the city, um, and other data sets about Boston. So that will become, again, synthesized into one collection. So we're seeing sort of Boston as a kind of four-dimensional space, going back through time and then the three dimensions of the city, where we can locate all the documents about the city, all the maps, all the data, um, you know, these 134 data sets include everything from where trees were planted every week of every year going back through time, um, real estate records, all of these things. So when, we, when a researcher comes and wants to study something like the desegregation of the Boston schools, we can provide them with a lot of what they need. Right? We can provide them with maps of where people lived, where they were bused to what the communities were like. We can provide them with the documents from those communities. So we become a kind of service organization around this specific research topic. We can help them um, do more with that um, as well, as I'll get to in just a second, around um, dealing with the scale of the data. So the library is user interface. When, when someone walks up the steps into the library, what, what are they imagining is sort of happening there. And I, I think here we still have work to do. I mean, we have work to do at Snell. I'm sure you have work to do as well. I think all libraries sort of present themselves in a specific way. Um, we have recently begun a kind of top to bottom um, re envisioning of the library that involves physical changes, but also changes around much of what I just mentioned. And a lot of this is this is our entry now, um, changing the space to think about it as a set of services and service desks and access points and help points um, to help people not only with um, what we have there, but also what they might be able to access. 
Um, it's really, really inspirational. Our offices for DPLA were in the Boston Public Library, and this is the uh, brutalist uh, Philip Johnson wing of the library. This is a photo the day it opened, 40-some um, years ago. And they recently renovated as well. And this is the, the new shot of that kind of entry point. You can see the kind of difference in it. And, and I won't get into the flashiness and all, all of that stuff. But I think a key point about it is that um, it's trying to emphasize that there's, there's material in the library. There's material um, that you can access through your library. It's both virtual and physical. I think a really great example of this is that they have a set of touch screens that, um, uh, in the lobby that show you um, materials that are being digitized one floor down um, in the digital suite where DPLA was based. Um, and you can actually go up and sort of surf through Boston and some old photos and actually pull it up on your phone and go out into the neighborhood. And so they're connecting, I think, in a really interesting way, the kind of virtual and the physical. So they're sort of bringing these worlds together through the kind of almost lobby um, acts as a kind of different read on what's happening uh, in the library. So I think you know this is one example, but but we're really thinking at, at Snell of how do, how do we actually present all of what I've just said um, to our audience, and how do we also deal with with this question that we are in fact I think like many of you we're pulling books from shelves we're we're having to move toward shared print storage. We need the space for other purposes. Um, we unfortunately can't build up or out. We're in an urban campus, so it's sort of our physical space is what it is. Um, and I think here we have been less good at articulating what's happening there. Um, I think when a lot of campuses try to move their books, they have angry um, faculty with pitchforks and torches and university librarians are run out of town. Um, and we have, so we've gently started to move books off campus. I took this photo this week. We're moving about 300,000 books off campus to, to the annex. Um, and and um, I, I even love, love that name. This isn't being recorded, is this right? But, um, so right, that, that idea that it's, it's like adjacent. Now, it happens to be 100 miles away. That's, we're going to take that out, right, of the video. But it's an annex. It's like it's just next door. It'll show up when you need it. We might even deliver it to your desk, or we may digitize it and send it to you. What, what have you? It'll be there for you. Um, uh, but, but as I've been thinking about this, um, again, the articulation of this to faculty, I think we've done, um, we've done not a great job at sort of re-articulating, again, the library and the library collection. And I think here I think about explaining the different uses that people have for library collections. So let me give you one example that I, I really like from my fellow historian and friend, Mike O'Malley. Um, you know, he was pointing out about, about books and that when people think about books, they sort of, they have one impression of it, which is, you know, their value, they're really valuable. You know, I've written a few books, you spend years on it, and you think about that, that value, and that's all you can think about, and you have trouble thinking about your use of the books, even though it may be different. And so Mike has this great line about, you know, we're taught to write as if our audience was a learned, learned man of leisure with servants, and we're taught to read like sous chefs gutting a fish quickly, ruthlessly, under time pressure. And I, I really love this idea because it's completely true, right? 90% of our uses of library materials, we hate to say it, are not you in your smoking jacket, in your personal home library, gently turning the pages. You're, you're going in, you're reading the intro and the conclusion, and you're looking at a citation. You're doing those quick things. For those purposes, right, a quick scan of a digital book is perfectly effective. And so I think if we think about the many different uses that people have for library collections, we can begin to kind of Think about, again, that network and the scale and what things we actually need proximate, what things can be in the annex, um, what kind of uses occur that are more sous chef -y and what things are more learned man of leisure or woman of leisure. Um, and, and we are starting now, we launched in the fall a new interface for our library, virtual interface from our, for our library that kind of levels out these different and articulates these different uses. So um, we do um, think about everything that we have as one collection.
but we're focusing on virtual browsing, one-click opening, the availability of materials wherever they are, if we link out to them, WorldCat or other places. We're trying to integrate as many books as we can and to say, okay, for these kinds of uses, fine, we'll get you a physical book if you, if you really want it, but you may be interested in a virtual book or virtual materials for a quick citation, for a quick look, to see if you may need to look at it further. That is really key. We're also trying to enable new things. Um, so I think, again, from the researcher's perspective, there's a lot of confusion out there about things like publishing. There are all these new venues that are, I get questions all the time, like, what, should I publish in an open access venue? What? Why should I do that? Is that going to hurt my reputation? What is this plus one thing? What's, you know, they, they don't get it. We live and breathe it, but most researchers are just head down focused on their world. And so we have started to set up a sort of publication services within our library to help researchers understand what are these different venues. The, the White Rose, I was really interested to in see this. I want to articulate to a historian why they might want to publish an open access monograph. I actually have two of my books that are open access. They get read far more than my, my other best-selling book on the history of math. Um, and, um, um, but the, their openness has actually been a, a big help to me. Um, it's sort of out there always working for me because people find it online and they can take a quick dive into it. And if they want, they can purchase the book. So what is this whole landscape? I think we have to articulate better to researchers. We talked a lot about um, and, I, and I heard yesterday a lot about how we create financial models um, around publishing for us. But I think we need to involve faculty in this much more and to say, here are some reasons to sort of work together with us on that. Just briefly, there's lots going on around digital scholarship and the services that we need to provide on it. I think a library is a great place for this. Um, we have specific librarians who help with all aspects of digital scholarship, help to data mine and do scale. Um, we have lots of projects at Northeastern, uh, many faculty working on large scale, purely digital projects that may start with physical objects like newspapers in the 19th century, but then go in and do data mining to see how, for instance, poetry was reprinted in newspapers across time. This is um, Ryan Cordell's viral text project um, where he's worked um, with a computer scientist, David Smith, to find replicated texts across time in the 19th century, doing really cutting edge, cutting edge research, but it's aided by um, the library as well. We also have dedicated, we have two dedicated data visualization librarians who do things like GIS, work in R, help researchers with them. So as we're pulling books out off of one of the floors of our library, we're putting in a suite. Um, I've, I've perhaps wrongly talked about it as a food court, um, but a place where there will be all these folks who you can drop in, find out what, what we have in the library, what's out there in the network, help you with the issue of scale. It's all in one place. It's all our library, but it's a new vision of a library that we're thinking about together. So thank you very much.